Good morning, everyone. This is Eleanor from The Revolution and The Rake. I am here at Anticorum with Julien Scherrer, who is the managing director and watch expert. And we are going to talk about the upcoming auction and the highlights that are going to be featured during this auction. So can you run through the couple of amazing pieces that you were able to get your hands on, especially, I'm going to say, to start with the Omega. Um, Absolutely which is one of the rare pieces that traveled in space for about one year. Exactly. So, uh, so this is uh, one of the very special Omega Speedmasters um, that was sent to the Mir station, as Eleanor explained. Uh, they actually only made seven of those pieces in gold, of which two were mounted on gold, five on leather, such as this example. And these were part of that mission to the Mir space station, where they actually stayed there for an entire year before being returned after extensive tests and then being sold to some of the VIP clients of Omega who had the opportunity to, to actually acquire the piece. But there's actually a couple of anecdotes on that piece. To start with the Mir station, which was the first uh, modular space station that was assembled in orbit. Um, and people were sent there to test out a couple of things, including um, watch mechanism and how the, um, um, how, how do you say in, in, in English, the, um, the fact that the apesanteur in space Yes, how the gravity the gravity is exactly the word I was looking affected for. the, the, the watch operating mechanism. movements of the mechanism and of the chronograph in space. And it turns out that one year later, it came back in perfect condition, which is a succe successful and ex succeeding test for Omega. Exactly, just like a lot of these dive watches or space watches to, to submit those into extreme conditions in order to find out whether they can survive these extraordinary conditions, which this one passed with flying colors is really a, a testament to the, to the overall build quality of Omega for the Speedmaster. So moving on to the second piece, do you want to talk about the other Omega or should we switch a little? And no, the other Omega is great. It's, uh, it's actually one of my favorite lots because uh, I think that these amazing skeletonized Omega uh, are still very undervalued in today's market. This is one of the exceptional pieces that was made in platinum, mounted on a platinum bracelet. They made 50 pieces. Uh, as a limited edition as well and hand engraving hand Armin engraving Strom. by Armin Strom exactly which is made to the highest level of quality as you can see and this one which actually belongs to the same consigner as the Omega Mir watch has been kept in really new condition and uh, and I think these are are very impressive not only in their weight but also in their fantastic finish and look. But that piece was created for the 25th anniversary. It was. Um, it was actually called the Moon Watch and not the Moon Swatch with everything that we've been here in the last couple of weeks. And needless to say that obviously the first Speedmaster Omega was sent to the moon on the wrist of Neil Armstrong in 1969. Um, do you think this collector has switched to a moon swatch to get rid of the <laughs> actual original ones? <laughs> I, I don't think so. I think he, he probably had a hard time like everybody else finding one. So um, I patience think- Patience uh, is key on that one. Patience is key for sure. <laughs> It'll come. It'll come. So moving on to the next, obviously with the upcoming anniversary of the Royalog from Audemars Piguet, you were able to get quite an extraordinary piece, not only because it's a Royalog, but just because the particularity not only is in platinum, but as you can see, there is no crown. Exactly. Um, on this version of the, the Royal Oak, um, AP decided to, to actually change the look and focus on only the pure octagonal shape of the case by removing the crown and actually setting it at the back with this back wind that you can actually see here to wind the watch, meaning that you can focus on only the pure beauty of the design from the outside without having any intervention. And do you think that's why, it's also one of the particularities that not only is an open work, but it's a tourbillon. So you add on top of it, the fact that it's a platinum version, you have no crown, you have the open work of 
basically the life of what's happening inside the, 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 the case. Exactly, and I, th I think the, the work on that has made it, the disposition also of the dial is particularly beautiful. They only made uh, seven, six actually, sorry, in platinum in this series with a platinum bracelet. I think it's one of those exceptional pieces that you probably really don't see. And it's lot number 433, and it's currently estimated between 400 and 600K, right? That's correct. That's correct. Well, good luck. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> good luck on that. Um, one before the last, I'm, I, I mean, it's the François Peljour. Um, as many of you know, if you've been following the brand, it was created in 1999, and François Peljour launched the Tourbillon Souverain, which is one of the most famous reference in his collection. And the second generation was launched in 2004, if I'm not mistaken. And not only the Salmon Dial makes this piece particular because it's very much in trend and a very sought after uh, piece, but can you explain to us what's the technical and mechanical um, interesting part of that watch? Well, on this, on this second series, what they really changed on that is François Paul decided to do a deadbeat second, which as you can see, if you look at it, the seconds actually beats, actually similar to a course watch mm -hmm. in, the, in the look, but of course has the mechanical aspect of it of only changing the second when the second has gone by. And this gives this ticking aspect to the seconds, which in the end is the characteristics of the remontoir d'égalité with seconde morte. But, but it's, it also, I mean, in, in doing so, it brings an even more precise... It does. Uh, that's correct. ...readability of the time. Like François Paul, nothing that's done is for aesthetics. <laughs> it's uh, all about technicality Everything has and a justification. Precision. Indeed, indeed. But I think probably one of the nicest looking in that combination of rose and rose dial, I think uh, no one can, can take that away saying that it's... Uh, aesthetically an amazing piece. And in pristine uh, condition as well. And condition is as new, nothing to say. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And last but not least, um, it's a unique piece, uh, a unique Patek Philippe pocket watch. Probably in the hype of everything else, probably my favorite piece in terms of variety, but I think in terms of collectability, but also in terms of quality. I think as most of the Patek Philippe enamel collectors know, this is a Suzanne Rohr. Uh, Suzanne Rohr is the best enameler recognized the worldwide, ultimate by anybody else. She formed um, Anita Porchet, who was her student after that, she actually worked for Patek Philippe on an exclusive for almost 50 years. Um, scholars say that she produced about 100 pieces over her whole career, so it means that she only was making about two to three pieces a year. This is, of course, after the famous painting by Vermeer, The Lady in the Jug world famous just like the milk lady another one that she another also one. did um, it seems according to our research that this is probably the third piece that she ever made in her career okay. as the reference number states it's a 715 dash 3 dash 3 means it's the third one that she mm -hmm. produced it's from 1967 so that's the first year that she collaborated with Patek Philippe and the pure quality and the detail of the enamel whether it's the veil on the lady whether it's the window whether it's the quality of her clothes there's the reason why she's the best and it's instantly seeable in the quality of the enamel that she's done and apparently it is so rare to find that even the collector who purchased the piece it was such a hard time for him to get a hold of that piece he purchased it at auction he had to because when he was looking for one at the time at Patek Philippe none were, none available. were available so buying it at auction was the only chance for him to buy he bought it at our auction in 1989 has kept it since he's now turning 91 so now it's time for him to pass it on to the next generation of collector and it's an amazing opportunity to buy one of the rare as Patek Philippe already owns 25 pieces in their museum of it Rohr. only, it only leads, <laughs> leaves a few 
two left available and that's one of them. It's lot 200 and it will be starting with an estimate of 200 to 300,000. Perfect. And not only it's a time piece, but it's an art piece and a unique piece. Indeed. So it should be your piece, in other words. It should be <laughs> anybody's piece. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, and no, thank you so much. Good luck for the rest of the days and upcoming auction. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.